These are the words of Edward T. Atkinson. At this quiet time and in this place of worship, we would seek to know more deeply what it means to love one another. We know so well our own needs. We know that we ourselves need understanding, affection, and recognition. Why is it then that so often we hesitate to extend these precious gifts to others? The cost of a kind word is small. The moment that it takes to listen could hardly be better used. A gesture of forgiveness can mark a new beginning. An embrace or a note of appreciation can convey critical encouragement and comfort. And yet, so often we fail even within our own families to live by the sacred command that we should love one another. Spirit of life and of love, strengthen our faith, Increase our resolve to give more generously of ourselves. We pray for the courage to take the risks of love. We pray for the insight to see ourselves and others in perspective. We pray for humility and understanding that we may always stand ready to forgive and begin anew. Amen. The reading this morning are the words of the late poet and philosopher John O'Donoghue. He wrote, The hunger to belong is at the heart of our nature. Cut off from others, we atrophy and turn in on ourselves. Merely to be excluded or to sense rejection hurts. When we become isolated, we are prone to being damaged. Our minds lose their flexibility and natural kindness. We become vulnerable to fear and negativity. A sense of belonging, however, suggests warmth, understanding, embrace. The ancient and eternal values of human life, truth, unity, goodness, justice, beauty, and love are all statements of true belonging. Our hunger to belong is the longing to bridge the gulf that exists between isolation and intimacy. Distance awakens longing. Closeness is belonging. Everyone longs for intimacy and dreams of a nest of belonging in which one is embraced, seen, and loved. Something within each of us cries out for belonging. We can have all the world has to offer in terms of status, achievement, and possession. Yet without a true sense of belonging, our lives feel empty and pointless. Like the tree that puts roots deep into the clay, each of us needs the anchor of belonging in order to bend with the storms and continue toward the light. The words of John O'Donoghue. In his book, Outliers, Malcolm Gladwell tells the story of a group of Italian immigrants who settled in Northeast Pennsylvania at the end of the 19th century. Naming the town Rosetto after the name of their village in Italy, they quickly set about bringing life to this new community, clearing the land, planting vegetables and trees, and later building factories to stir industry. Eventually, Rosetto, Pennsylvania, became a self-sufficient community isolated from the rest of the region and seemingly the world. What really made Rosetto unique, however, as researchers would find out later, was that the people of this town were remarkably healthy and happy. For example, in the history of the town, virtually no one under 55 died of a heart attack or showed any signs of heart disease. For men over 65, the death rate from heart disease in Rosetto was roughly half that of the United States as a whole. The death rate from all causes in Rosetto, in fact, was something like 30, 35% lower than it should have been. In addition, there was no evidence of suicide, drug addiction, alcoholism, and very little crime. How to explain this? Researchers looked at neighboring towns to see if it had to do with the geographic region 
but they found no comparisons with the startling statistics found in Roseto. They located relatives of these town folk who had settled in other parts of the country, but still no luck. They even looked at histories of the ancestors in Italy from which the original immigrants had left, but they still found no evidence of the remarkable signs of health and vitality found in Roseto. Eventually, researchers realized that it wasn't diet or exercise or location or genes that accounted for the findings in Roseto. It was the town itself. They noticed the way in which townsfolk greeted each other and stopped to talk, how they extended a helping hand to each other in times of distress or misfortune, how respect for elders was an expectation among the youth, how several generations of families lived in the same household, how the sense of community permeated people's lives and interaction with each other. It was the healthy culture, it was the sense of community and belonging that the townspeople of Rosetto had created that contributed to their individual and collective health and prosperity. In the same way, creating healthy congregations means creating communities where members look out for one another, pay attention to one another, and come together in times of crisis. It means creating a truly multi-generational congregation and one where each member understands their responsibility in ensuring the success of the spiritual community. It means creating a sense of true belonging, not just welcoming, but belonging, where every member feels that this is home. Sociologist Tessie Naraho noted, it's the most precious thing to know absolutely where you belong. To be intimate is to grow, to learn. It is absolutely fulfilling. To belong, writes Peter Block, author of Community Structure of Belonging and my hero, is to be related to and a part of something. It is membership, the experience of being at home in the broadest sense of the phrase. To belong, Block writes, is to know even in the middle of the night that I am among friends. But Block also defines belonging in more individu individualistic terms. He says that belonging can also be thought of as a longing to be. Being is our capacity to find our deeper purpose in all that we do. It is the capacity to be present and to discover our authenticity and our whole selves. Community, he continues, is the container within which our longing to be is, to be, is fulfilled. Without the connectedness of a community, we will continue to choose not to be. Community, finding a deeper purpose, discovering our authenticity, our whole selves, aren't these the words, the concepts that we associate with our faith? Couldn't one make the case that finding and maintaining a sense of belonging is the essence of Unitarian Universalism? How then do we create this sense of belonging? How do we, as John O'Donoghue writes in the earlier reading, feed the hunger to belong? It begins, says Bloch, with the invitation, the means through which hospitality and belonging are created. Inviting someone into community is an act of generosity, a call to create an alternative future, to join in the possibility that we have declared. When we genuinely invite someone to share an idea, a task, a project, it changes our relationship with them because we come to them as equals. And in our invitation, we must be willing to take no for an answer without resorting to various, various forms of persuasion. In your life here in this congregation, I imagine there are many times when you call on each other to help, to participate, to share, to give, to sacrifice. Whether it's to participate in your annual fund drive or teach religious education, serve as a greeter, or contribute to the musical life of the church. 
The anxiety of invitation, says Bloch, is that if we give others a choice, they might not show up. It is difficult for us to face the reality of their absence, reservations, passivity, or indifference. We do not want to face the prospect that we, or just a few of us, may be alone in the future that we want to pursue. But the rewards of genuine invitation, of being willing to take no for an answer, is that you find yourself in a room or on a project with people who are up to something larger than their immediate self-interest. You are with others who want to be there. The invitation to belong to something greater than ourselves is just the beginning. Peter Block outlines five conversations, five components that are central to a transformative and inclusive community where everyone feels a sense of belonging. Those conversations revolve around the concepts of possibility, ownership, dissent, commitment, and gifts. The Buddhist monk, teacher, and author Thich Nhat Hanh wrote, we have more possibilities available in each moment than we realize. Possibility, according to writer and lecturer Werner Erhardt, is a declaration of what we create in the world each time we show up. It is the statement of a future condition that is beyond reach, an act of imagination of what we can create together. It is not a goal or prediction. It is not about what we plan to happen or what we think will happen or whether things will get better. It is simply a declaration of what is possible. The possibility of a healthy and thriving congregation, the possibility of a vibrant and inclusive religious education program, the possibility of a successful capital campaign, the possibility of a local community in which members of the congregation are visible, vocal, and involved. Involvement, commitment, enthusiasm, belonging, they all materialize when we begin talking about what is possible. The second conversation is ownership. The ownership conversation asks us to act as if we are creating what exists in the world. But this requires that we believe in the possibility that this congregation is ours to create. If we do not believe that, if we do not feel accountable to each other to create this faith community, then how can we truly feel a sense of belonging? Accountability, says Block, is the willingness to acknowledge that we have participated in creating the conditions that we wish to see changed. Community, he says, will be created the moment we decide to act as creators of what it can become. Block reminds us that each time people enter a room, they walk in with ambivalence, wondering whether this is the right place to be. This is because they believe that someone else owns the room. When you, all of you, walk into this building on a Sunday or on a weeknight, you have to walk in knowing that this is the right place to be knowing that this is where you belong, that this is the reality that you have helped to create. As members of this community, you must constantly ask yourselves and each other the questions that Peter Block proposes. How valuable an experience do you plan for this to be? How much risk are you willing to take? How participative do you plan to be? To what extent are you invested in the well-being of the whole? And perhaps the most difficult question of all, what have I done to contribute to the very thing that I complain about or want to change? Werner Earhart talks about the transformative power of stories. There are stories, he says, that give meaning to our lives and help us find our voice and then there are those stories that limit our possibility. Limiting stories are personal visions of the past. They are stories about the conclusions we drew from events that happened to us. 
They often place us as victims of events or even fate. The decision to tell these stories over and over again as if they were defining truths creates the limitation against an alternative future. So what are the stories that you tell yourself that limit your involvement in creating the reality that is this congregation, that prevent you from feeling as if you belong? A few years ago, I attended the Ohio Meadville District Summer Institute in rural Ohio. It's a week-long family experience for Unitarian Universalists. They have three, 400 people that attend, complete with workshops and social events and increasingly sparsely attended worship services as the week went on. The event had a camp-like feeling to it. And for many participants, this week was their family vacation. I quickly told myself that these were not serious Unitarian Universalists, that they were there primarily to socialize, to do yoga, and engage in arts and crafts, and go on ghost walks and play party games. I convinced myself in a very short time that this was not the place where I belonged. And I told that story to myself over and over again. And having convinced myself of the truth of this story, I began to look for evidence to support it. The result was that I resisted getting involved in many of the social events that were available to me. I missed the opportunity to meet more people and develop more and deeper relationships. And as I did so, I felt more isolated and became more convinced that this was a place where I did not belong how easy it is to fall into this trap, to convince ourselves that we are not needed or not listened to or that we have been wronged in some way. The challenge that we all face is to not give in to the stories that are limiting, but to tell ourselves stories that expand our hopes and dreams, that give us confidence, and that place us squarely in the middle of congregational life where we know we belong and can contribute. Conversation number three concerns itself with dissent. One sure way to counter a sense of belonging is to stifle dissent and to require that everyone agree and comply. Creating space for dissent, says Peter Block, is the way diversity gets valued in the world. Inviting dissent into the conversation is how we show respect for a wide range of beliefs. We need to meet dissent, not with resistance, but with curiosity. Not with resistance, but with curiosity. Bloch says the best way to respond to a dissenting opinion is to get interested in it, to listen to it. The moment people experience the fact that they can dissent or express doubts and not lose their place in the community, they begin to join as full-fledged members. So the questions we need to ask ourselves are, what doubts and reservations do we have? What is the no that we keep postponing? What have we said yes to that we no longer really mean? What is a commitment or decision that we have changed our minds about? When we can answer and honestly discuss these questions in community, when dissent is truly valued and becomes the object of genuine curiosity, the chance of showing up as an owner of this faith community, the chance of feeling that one belongs goes up dramatically. Commitment comprises conversation number four. Author James Womack wrote that commitment unlocks the doors of imagination, allows vision, and gives us the right stuff to turn our dreams into reality. Commitment, says Bloch, is a promise made with no expectation of return. It is the willingness to make a promise independent of either approval or reciprocity from other people. When one makes a commitment, they do not make it with the expectation that others will make the same commitment. If I make a promise that is contingent on the actions of others, it is not a commitment, it is a deal, a bargain, a contract. 
So here in this faith community, we need to make commitments without qualification or contingencies or asterisks. We commit to acting independently of what others may do in return. As Bloch suggests, we need to ask ourselves, what promises am I willing to make? What price am I willing to pay? And what is the cost to others for me to keep my commitments or to fail in my commitments? Bloch wisely points out that lip service is the enemy of commitment. Lip service is the enemy of commitment. The future does not die from opposition, but it disappears in the face of lip service. The only act that puts membership at risk is the unwillingness to honor our word. Refusing to make a promise, he says, is an act of integrity and supports community. Not honoring our word, either by not fulfilling our promises or retracting them when they know they will not be fulfilled, sabotages community. The final conversation involves the speaking of gifts, both the gifts that we bring to this congregation and the gifts that we acknowledge in others. Researcher and Northwestern University professor John McKnight asserts that community is built by focusing on people's gifts rather than their deficiencies. We are not defined by deficiencies or what is missing. Instead, we are defined by our gifts and by what is present. We embrace our own destiny when we have the courage to acknowledge our own gifts and choose to bring them into the world. When we choose to contribute to creating the reality that is this congregation, we do so by sharing our gifts with each other and with the world. Belonging occurs also when we tell others what gift we receive from them. When this occurs in the presence of others, community is built. Yet how often do we acknowledge the gifts that others give to us? How often do we take the time to notice? Belonging begins and ends when we both acknowledge in others and hear in ourselves the gifts that we bring to this faith community time and time again. These then are the conversations we need to be having with each other in groups both small and large. We need to first invite people into community with a willingness to take no for an answer. We need to talk of possibilities as declarations of what we want to see in the world. We need to take ownership and know that each of us is equally responsible for creating the reality that is this congregation. We need to embrace dissent and respond to it with interest and openness. We need to make commitments that are not compromised by expectations of something in return. And we need to both acknowledge the gifts that we bring into the world and the gifts that others bring to us. In so doing, we create community. We create a sense of belonging. We feed the hunger to belong. This process is not easy. The questions that I oppose today are often uncomfortable to address. But an awareness of what is necessary is how we begin. And a promise to do our best is how we move forward. Individual and collective health and prosperity for our beloved UU community is the possibility. And like the townspeople of Rosetto, Pennsylvania, can be achieved through a common purpose and through a shared sense of belonging and community. May it be so.